Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen. Dave, it's all yours. Look out, he said, it's all mine. It's good to see you all this morning. You can lie and say it's good to see me too, it's okay. I mean, it's just, I think we don't call it lying, we call it being nice, right? So, you know. But, uh, let me see, I got that one on, I got this one. Get that one on too. Double mic'd now, so you can really hear me. I am a little bit bummed that... Uh, there's not more people here because I worked extra hard. I even got pictures to show you. And, um, You're going around the world, though. Well, maybe. I mean, it, here's the thing about streaming the Internet. Somebody's got to watch it or it don't count for nothing. Right? So I'm sure there are some people watching. I, I think one of them is my wife who's not feeling well this morning, but uh, that's okay. And That's right. And so here's the thing. There's a story told about a farmer. And uh, he'd go out to, to feed the cows in the morning, right? And uh, every morning he'd load up the truck and take the food out, to, you know, cows out there and feed them. And one morning he goes out there and only half the cows are out there. He don't know where the rest of them are. So he's got to decide. Do I put all the food out here? Or do I only just, you know, a little bit of food because I only got a little bit of cows out here? And the answer, if you're preaching, is you put all the food out there because somebody's going to come along and pick it up, hopefully. So that's a real quick word of prayer before we get started. Father, just again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for these wonderful friends that I have here, my brothers and sisters. Thank you for this wonderful church the wonderful people that you've placed in it. And Lord, we, we want to fill this church. We don't want another Sabbath of, wow, everybody can fit it into half the church. We want a Sabbath of, wow, we're going to have to go buy some chairs or something. Or, wow, don't nobody call the fire marshal or we're going to be in trouble. And Lord, if we are acting in your will, those days will come. And we pray, Lord, that that is exactly what we'll be doing. As for this morning, Lord, I just ask that you will hide me behind the cross of Christ, that you will um, block all the goofy things I say and do, and that those who hear whatever comes out of my mouth will hear your words and not mine. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a lot of you know me well enough to know that I like history. I like reading about things that happened, and I like learning about the events and the people that have shaped the world that we live in today. Um, I, I guess I got this from my dad, who was actually a history major, although um, he said that teaching history is impossible because you're either just telling stories or you're boring the heck out of people. Um, and also, you guys might have heard of this fellow named Solomon. He said that there's nothing new under the sun. So Sometimes, knowing a little bit about what's happened in the past uh, can save some pain in the future. And uh, I'm just going to give you a quick illustration from, from my personal history. And uh, remember, kids, some stories are about what not to do, just like some lives are just lived as a warning to the others, right? So don't do this. My buddy John House and I were, were 15. We were both 15, and his dad gave him an old beater Dodge Omni. If you guys remember the Dodge Omni, it's a classic. Uh, kind of looks like that. It was a red Dodge Omni, too. It didn't look that good. That's a pretty good-looking Dodge Omni, uh, as such things go. But um, we got it running, put a stereo in it, put big speakers in it, because that's what John wanted in his car. Um, it's all ready to go. Only one problem. We're both 15. The car is not registered. The car is not insured. And neither one of us has a driver's license. But, I mean, 
You going to let that stop you, really? No, of course not. So I was going to cut to the chase. Uh, broke a bunch of laws, not just about you know unregistered, uninsured vehicles on the road and uh, unlicensed drivers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it really worked out in my favor that the one law that my buddy John was absolutely we must obey is the seatbelt law, which back then was a brand new thing and nobody wore seatbelts. But he insisted that I wear a seatbelt. And in less than an hour, we were upside down in a ditch and I was hanging from my seatbelt. So it kind of looked like this, except in a ditch instead of a parking lot. And uh, John and I had to uh, crawl out the passenger window. And uh, we walked to a nearby house, made a phone call, got a couple friends to come over and put the car back up on its wheels like that. Um, As it happens, one of my best friends, a guy named Steve, who brought a truck and a chain, which really did most of the tipping it back on its wheels, he pointed out that uh, this is really all for naught because uh, when what happened had happened, it broke a tie rod, and so our front wheels were going like this instead of like this or like this or like that. So we weren't going anywhere. But got it back on its wheels, and uh, our good friends, our best friends in the whole wide world, all vanished before the cops could show up. So, I don't know why the cops didn't actually show up. We stood around for a little bit, and I guess I'm going I'm to blame it on the, the, the concussion, the big knot I had on my forehead. But we called my parents to come and get us. And uh, I was trying to get my dad to come and get us, because my dad was usually a little more cool about uh, technically you stole a car and broke it, you know, that kind of thing. You, pff, whatever. Um, but he, he wasn't really in a fit state to drive, so both my parents came. And when they arrived at the scene, as you might would expect, my dad stood back, took it all in, and had belly laughs. And my mother stood there, took it all in, and screamed like a banshee. So, long story short, I kind of wish the cops had shown up, quite frankly. It would have been easier. Now, we dropped John off at his mom's house. We went home, and I'm thinking, I gotta do something. I gotta get out. I am like this is I've been in trouble, but this 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 capital T trouble, right? So eventually my mom calmed down, went to bed, and heard my dad shuffle off into the kitchen and pour himself another martini and I executed my plan. Went out and I had a little heart to heart when my dad stood there face to face and uh I, I made a speech that would have made the prodigal son proud. Um and I'm not going to tell you what I said, and I won't give you exactly what my father said, because we are in church. But um, the gist of what he said has been echoing around in my head for more than 30 years now. It's what he, kind of what he said. He said, son, you can learn from other people's mistakes. Right? This is what history is about. You don't have to go out and make every mistake yourself. It's not a requirement, as it turns out. I didn't know that when I was 15. I thought I had to do it all myself. Well, the scripture that Lillian just read, thank you, Lil, might seem to be unrelated or tangentially related to the foolishness that I've just described. But I want you to stick with me for a minute. And I think that, you know, we'll, we'll bring it together and it all makes sense. Now. I think that this verse in, in, uh, in 2 Chronicles 7 is, is, is probably familiar to, to most of you, maybe all of you. Um, but the background of this is, or the context of this is, Solomon has just finished building the temple, and God's speaking to Solomon, right? Solomon, we know, what do we know about Solomon other than he's David's son? Anybody? Anybody? Huh? Why has this man ever lived, right? So he's just finished the temple. And God appears to him and has what I think you can only describe as a frank conversation. So let's take a look in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 12 of chapter 7. Um, this is what it says. Um, this is uh, from the uh, New Living Translation, I believe. One night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place, the place for making sacrifices. 
And he goes on. Like that, that's good news, right? All right, the Lord has heard my prayer, and he's chosen this place. I have built this building for him, and he's chosen it. This is going to be the place. But God doesn't stop there. He keeps talking. He says, now, at times, I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls, or I might send out grasshoppers to devour your crops, or I might send plagues among you. And then he gets to the verse that we all like to read. And we talked about, I heard, I was getting pulled a lot of directions during Sabbath school, but I heard somebody say something, of, something like this, right? Oh, we like to read that verse, but not so much those verses, right? So then, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. Now this is a building that we're talking about, right? This is the, the, the actual conversation that God had with Solomon. And the temple was the Temple of Solomon, the big glorious Temple of Solomon. Now, I could spend about two hours going through the New Testament and a whole bunch of the Paul's writings, um, but I'm not going to. I'm going to ask you one question. Shortly before he was crucified, Jesus made a prediction to the Pharisees and Sadducees. And what was that prediction? He says, if you destroy this temple, I will do what? I'll restore it in three days. Do you remember what they said to him? They said, bro, it took 64 years to build this thing. You're going to rebuild it in three days? But what temple was Jesus talking about? The, the temple of his body, right? So, In Solomon's day, the temple was a temple. It's a bit, nice big building, all sorts of craziness in there. In what I'm going to just refer to as the Christian era, we understand that the temple that Solomon built was not the, the temple, right? That temple, just like the one that was carried around in the wilderness, was based on a template that was given in heaven. And that ultimately, the temple is Jesus himself. Now, let's take a real closer look at verse 13, where God says, Now, hey, Solomon, bro, just, just so you know, at times I might shut the heavens so it doesn't rain, might send a plague of locusts, just so you know. Now, he's not saying that, hey, Solomon, I like playing tricks on people. It's not boredom or capriciousness. It, it's... it's <laughs> It's none of those things. And this is made clear and obvious in verse 14, where he says there's a mechanism by which you can be restored. And that mechanism is humble yourselves, pray, sink my face, turn from your wicked ways. So the things that at times might happen in verse 13 are a result of what? Of sin, right? So, it's an interesting thing, and this is, this is I mean, this is not news, right? I, mean, I hope this is not news to you. Um, but there are instances throughout history where we can actually see this uh, happen, and you can look back and you can go, whoa, like a real Bill and Ted kind of, whoa, right? So... I was actually planning on preaching a sermon about a month ago because for like the first time ever, I was prepared well in advance, okay? But it didn't work because we had Steve here and Steve couldn't swap and it's okay. So a month ago was the 83rd anniversary of the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force along with remnants of French, Belgian, and Polish armies, which you may have ref heard referred to as the Miracle of Dunkirk. Anybody heard of that? All right. So if you haven't heard about it, they got movies, they got books, they get the internet, you can, you can look it up. But stuff that you don't see in the movies, because the people that make the movies like to minimize this sort of thing, is that truth is honestly stranger than fiction sometimes. So now 
When I say British expeditionary force, I don't want you to misunderstand what that term means. I, I, I'm going to call it classic British understatement. I hear expeditionary force, and I, I think it's like a, ha a handful of guys in Africa looking for Dr. Livingston, right? No, no, no. This is more than 250,000 men. This is the entire British army. They call it the expeditionary force because, well, they were in France, not England, on an expedition. So what had happened? You guys know World War II, 1939, Hitler, Poland, big bad things. Next thing you know, France, England, declare war. But <clears throat> almost 400,000 people, if you look at the British Expeditionary Force, the French Army, uh, the Belgian Army, the Dutch, and what was left of the Polish Army, had been pushed hard and fast all the way across Europe, from Poland, across everything else, you know, across Germany, across Belgium, France, and here we are in northeast France, uh, and, and Germany can, cannot be stopped, right? This is, this is Rommel's, you know, panzer divisions, right? These guys are coming hard and fast, and they are killing everything in their path. And the British Expeditionary Force and, and their buddies are running out of continent, right? Once you get to northeast France, it's water. It's a lot of water. It's deep water. It's fast-moving water, and it's got big waves. It's called the English Channel. It's a lot of water. And even though at Dunkirk you're really close to Dover, it's still like 40 miles or something like that. It's a long swim. It's a long walk, if you could do that. It's a really long swim. But here comes the Panzer Divisions, and they've encircled the Allies. And the Allies are forced into this little seaside town of Dunkirk and forced through the town of Dunkirk to the point where if you look at here, you've got dudes on the beach. That's what I named this picture. Dudes on the beach hoping for rescue because the town's already full. They're out of space, up against the water. On May 27th, and this is a little out of order, but I just want you to know this now. May 27, 1940, this is what the German High Command said. The British Army is encircled, and our troops are proceeding to its annihilation. That's what they said. Now, they said that on the 27th because of a weird, miraculous thing that happened on the 24th, but we'll get to that. Now, before these dudes are all on the beach, they're, they're going that way, Churchill the Admiralty, all the people that knew what was going on, knew that they were in big trouble, right? And the guy who was king at the time, King George VI, that would have been Queen Elizabeth's dad, uh, he knew it too. So you got Churchill and the admirals that are over here trying to figure out what they're going to do. And King George says, I know what I'm going to do. That's King George VI. That's a handsome looking guy, right? And because it's a war on, he is in his uniform and all that stuff. And this is a still photo of a, uh, a radio broadcast that he made, which was also filmed. Uh, and he, dressed, he, ad he addressed all of um, the British Empire. So not just England, Scotland, Wales, and parts of Ireland. This is 1940. The, British, the sun never set on the British Empire. This is back in those days. It wouldn't be for long, but at the time it was back in those days. So it goes to Canada, it goes to India, it goes to Australia. And this is what he said. I'm not going to quote him because I don't have the right accent. But what he said was, this is on May 24th. He says, hey, y'all, this coming Sunday on the 26th, we are going to set this day aside as a national day of prayer. We are going to repent and we are going to ask God for divine intervention in this great crisis that we face. Now, that's one thing for the king to say, hey, y'all, be good if you went and prayed, right? Kind of, like, I mean, you know, like, it'd be good, you know. Like, what if Jeff Fryer up here, like, hey, y'all, 
You might want to think about praying. Oh, that's fine and dandy. But he did join better. And that is, on Sunday morning, the king and the queen, with many members of parliament, Churchill and his cabinet, a bunch of other officials, set the example. They went to Westminster Abbey early Sunday morning. The uh, king and the queen of Holland were there because, you know, the Germans had already taken over, so they were hiding. And literally, millions of people throughout the Commonwealth went to church. If you wanted to go to church that day and spend a little time in prayer, you better have uncomfortable shoes because you were going to be standing in line for a long, long time. And if you thought that the churches here in America got crowded after 9-11, you ain't seen nothing. I'm going to uh, show you this picture. That is the Queen and the King and Winston Churchill. Um, over on the other side is uh, like a little handbill prayer to Almighty God at this time of war for May 26th. And I'm going to play just uh, a little bit of this clip. This is like a, one of those newsreel type things. So, um, oh, you know what? We're probably going to have to, uh, I forgot to get that, Jeff. All right. I'll set it up here in, uh, in the meantime. Tell me when you're ready, bro. There it is. The Empire responds to the King's call. And at Westminster Abbey, heart of the empire, the Look statesmen, the, the soldiers, the ambassadors, and hundreds of ordinary men and women join the mighty congregation. Her Majesty Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands arrives a few moments before their majesties. No one here today could foresee the grave news that has come from Belgium. All the more, it is well for us to show the world that we still believe in divine guidance, in the laws of Christianity. May we find inspiration and faith from this solemn day. Can you imagine if there was a line from our front door up here, down the little hill, down the road, all the way to the circle, of people just trying to get into church and pray for a few minutes? How about that? Now, I'd like to see that without, you know, the Germans going crazy again, but, you know, still. Well, that, that verse, second, you know, second Chronicles uh, 7.14, it talks about if my people will, will humble themselves, right? Now, if my darling wife were here, she would tell you, I have no use for royalty, British or otherwise, and I really enjoy reminding her that the United States fought and won two wars for the privilege of saying, we don't need no stinking kings here, right? But I've got to call it how I see it. And George VI made a statement that it's hard to imagine hearing from another head of state today, elected or born or whatever. This is what he said. He says, put your trust in God as I do. In other words, the king of England is saying, hey, y'all, I ain't got the answers. Well, I got the answer because I know the one that has the answers. But this is the reigning monarch of what was still literally a global empire and it's a statement, I think, of real humility. Now, being wartime, and being that the 24-hour news cycle is still 60 years in the future, not a lot of people actually knew what was happening in Dunkirk. If you weren't high up in the government or in the military, you just knew that your brothers and your sons were off there somewhere doing something, and boy, those Germans sure do look angry, but you didn't know the details. And you didn't know how dire the situation was. But when the king came on the radio and says, guys, we need to pray about this. I want everybody to come together and pray. They did. You saw little snapshots of how long the lines were, right? I actually had found some pictures, still pictures, where you could look at it, but they were so terrible that you can't see anything. So, um, so I'll show you this, this one. This is a, a still for trying to get into uh, 
uh, Westminster, I believe. Now, 26 was that Sunday that they prayed, and the evacuation of Dunkirk commenced on Monday, the 27th. Now, this is what Churchill's advisors, the people that planned this whole thing, this is what they said. We can maybe get 20 or 30,000 men out of there. That leaves a lot of dead people. But the people that told Churchill this, I don't know, maybe they weren't part of the praying crowd, or maybe they just told him this before the praying started. But when God's people come together and they repent and they seek God's face, things happen. First thing that happened on May 24th, ain't nobody prayed yet. May 24th, when Georgia 6 announced that we're going to have this National Day of Prayer here in a few days, God already was intervening. What happened? Well, on the 24th, Hitler told his generals to stop their advance. No reason was given. If you look it up in history books today, they will tell you it is a mystery. Nobody knows why he gave the order. There was some talk about, well, what about our flanks, this and that. They had him surrounded. There were no flanks. For three days, the entire German Panzer divisions we're kicking back, cooling their heels, waiting for somebody to allow them to finish destroying the entire British Army. Second thing that happened. On May 28th, a huge storm stalled over the area, and it grounded the, the Luftwaffe. And Luftwaffe, I'm just going to point you back to this. These are guys out on the beach waiting to get rescued. Well. Before the 28th, these fighters from Luftwaffe would come down and they would make strafing runs across the beach. And 20 millimeter cannons, 50 caliber machine gun fire, do a lot of damage. So God says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have a storm so bad that they can't fly in it. Boom. Done. And in fact, in this photo, it's a little hard to see, but it's part of its smoke, part of its haze. This isn't a bright, sunny day that we're looking at here in this photo. Now, third, we got that huge storm, right? We got the German Air Force grounded. The English Channel became dead calm, like a puddle, for over a week. And what this allowed was for little boats to cross the channel safely. And these little boats were used to get soldiers off of the beaches and off of the breakwaters uh, out far enough where the, the larger Navy vessels, uh, you know, because they, they take up a little more under, space under the water, right? Um, even the, the smallest Navy vessels, like a destroyer, um, it can't, you can't pull that thing up to the beach. So there's about 850 little boats that took part in, this in the evacuation. And they ranged in from, from fishing, fishing boats, you know, fishing trawlers, to pleasure craft, to rowboats. Some of these boats had never been out of uh, Dover's Harbor, because they were not seagoing vessels. And I want to show you just how little some of these little boats are. Can you imagine? You're in Dover, and the call goes out, hey, if you got a boat and can get it to France, we really need some help. Would you get, would you get in that one and go, got you, Captain, let's go. No, man, it's crazy. But they did it. Now, obviously, Dunkirk is a seaside town, and it had a port. Unfortunately, the deep water port had been destroyed, so there was only two ways to get people out of Dunkirk. Little boats right up to the beach, schlep them out to where the big boats are, or uh, the breakwater. So if you guys have been to the beach, you see sometimes a jetty where there's like big rocks or concrete things that go way out. I'm going to show you one in a minute. And I want you to imagine all your kid on your back, 
I'm just going to go out there and then hop on a boat and go home. But in the meantime, somebody rocked up on a beach for a little dinghy like that and said, we're here to rescue you. I think you were nuts. But I'd probably still get in the boat because the alternative, not good. Now, another great picture. What you see here, this is a, a look out towards the sea from the beach, and you see all these guys standing in line, going around like it's at Disneyland. Um, and far out there, the guys are standing in line, and they are chest deep in water. Because that's what you have to do. There's something very British about standing in line in chest deep water. I, I don't know. Very strange. So this is what's called the East Mole. This is a breakwater. There's two of them. There's one on the east, one on the west. And I want you to imagine that uh, you've got your pack on, weighs about 80 pounds. You've got your rifle. You've got your little metal hat on. And somebody says, all right, just walk on out to the end of that thing, and there'll be a boat there to pick you up. Don't fall. Right? It's, it's crazy. But you would have to make your way out there along those little piles of concrete. And uh, once you get out far enough, you could get right on the uh, British destroyer. Now, this picture actually was taken in 2007. It's the only color picture I have today. But it hasn't really changed a lot uh, since 1940. And it's not for nothing that I'm showing you these pictures, y'all. I, I want to be sure that we, that we really understand what the situation was. You have 400,000 men about to be annihilated by the German army. And there, at that time, was no power on earth that could have prevented it. Nothing. And if it had happened, if the German army had indeed destroyed the British Expeditionary Force in Dunkirk, what about the French resistance? Would there have been anybody left to resist? How would have England have con con continued the fight? How might history have changed? How might Europe be different today? But out of God's providence, instead of rescuing 20 or 30,000, as predicted, more than 338,000 men escaped all the way to England. That's not including the people that died because they got, you know, their boat sank on the way back. Um, because the English Channel was mined and their submarines and all that stuff. 338 men escaped to England, including, out of that 338,000, 140,000 French, Belgian, Dutch, and Polish soldiers. So, if you were one of those guys, that's what it would have looked like on your way home. Standing room only, and nobody cares. Very grateful. Now, as a result, or in response, however you want to say it, of this absolute miracle, Winston Churchill, who was not a religious man, declared Sunday, June 9th, as a national day of Thanksgiving. And he is the one that actually coined the phrase, Miracle of Dunkirk. And as I said, Winston Churchill is a guy that knew a lot of words, always chose them very carefully and was not inclined religiously or to believe in miracles. Had no other explanation for it. So what, Dave? 83 years ago, you said. Yeah, 83 years ago. And I know that all y'all lead perfect lives and all that, but I just want you to indulge me for a moment because just maybe, just maybe one person here or, or maybe somebody that's watching online uh, because they think they're not perfect enough to join all you perfect people here in the flesh. Um, maybe one of you is like me, a sinner saved by grace. And, and, and maybe, you know, you're like me, and every now and again you find yourself in a situation where a little repentance is in order, and a little divine intervention is needed. Now, if that's not you, okay, you go ahead and take a nap. But if it is you, and it is me, when I look at the events of Dunkirk, and I see all the things that happen, and, and guys, I mean, I'm giving you the overview. All right? I, could speak, I could stand here for three hours, ask my wife, I have done it to her. 
hours of, and then this, and then this. And can you believe that? Right? And Hitler's got him right where he wants him. Can at will destroy the British Army. But instead, says, I'm going to call a halt here. Does that make any sense? No, nah, makes no sense. Somehow, out of nowhere, comes a storm that is so bad that planes can't fly. But at the same time, in that same area, in the English Channel, which has very strong currents and very high seas on a good day, suddenly becomes dead calm and stays that way for a week, which coincidentally is just long enough for the evacuation to be completed. When I see these things, I get excited. And I get excited not just because I like reading history and I like learning things, but I get excited because I see the hand of God moving in the events of our world. Now, just like we like to tell people about the prophecies of Daniel 2, you get the statue, you get the head of gold, you get the chest of silver, all that stuff, right? Why do we do that? We do it because we want people to understand that God knows his history from beginning to end and can guide us and direct us. And we can know the future based on what the past has been, right? Or what God has told us about the future. So, and that's great. Babylon was a long time ago. And 83 years ago, 1940, not that long ago. My dad was a World War II vet. My mom was born in 1940, two months, at, right, month and a half after Dunkirk. And yes, for all you mathematicians, my dad was a bit of a cradle robber, but you know, that's not the point. The point is that this is not a zillion years ago. You can still talk to people today that remember this happening. I mean, they're not young anymore, but there are still people alive that can, that can tell you Oh, yeah. I mean, I was young, but I remember that. I remember standing in line for church for four hours or whatever. But here's the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the point. There comes a time, or there will come a time, or times, in the life of every individual, in the life of every family, in the life of every community, whether that's a religious community like we have here at church, or the greater community of Pittsburgh, Chatham County, North Carolina, Western civilization, you name it, there comes a time when the stuff gets real. And you know what I mean when I say that. Now, we get kind of a small church here, right? Particularly today, we're not exactly packing them in, but we get a small church. And even if you're relatively new here, and maybe you think that people don't really know you that well, they don't know your story, we all know that you have a story, just like you know, that we all have a story. This is part of what we inherited from Adam. It's just part of the deal. Something in your life has been broken. It just has. Now, I don't see anybody young enough to, for this to apply to, but maybe online or somebody. It's super young, super lucky. Just wait. You can hear me now, or you can hear me later echoing in your dreams. Because it's going to happen. The beautiful thing is that God does not leave us destitute and without hope we're in the, when we're in these circumstances. You know, you were talking about prayer. We were asking for prayer for your husband, right? I asked him for prayer for my mother in law. Right now, I'll be honest with you guys, my mother in law wishes that she was not alive. She's in a lot of pain. She has a great deal of difficulty doing anything. She realizes that she's a burden on her children. And I mean that in the nicest way possible. Don't, don't get me wrong. I don't consider her to be a burden. Her children don't consider her to be a burden. But in her head, that's how she feels. We've been praying for Gloria. We're praying for a miracle there. But in all these circumstances, what are we really praying for? We're really praying for God's will to be done in our lives and for us to understand and accept that. And we can understand and accept that only insofar as we believe that God's will 
is something that can be exercised in this world and that God's will is perhaps better than our will. Crazy, right? This is what God said to Solomon. And I'm gonna, this is the Dave translation of the Bible, right? So you don't like it, deal with it. Right from the jump. It says, Solomon, great building, looks fantastic. Yet all the windows are level and straight and everything. Fantastic. But that's today. This is awesome today. You got the priests in here, and they're all doing the right thing today. The people have brought their talents, they've sacrificed their time and their treasure to, to make this happen. And they're all in today. But Solomon, get wise, bro. Because tomorrow, or maybe the next day, are not going to be like today. Things are going to go sideways. Your priests are going to be in here in my temple offering strange fire. They're going to be up on the hilltops with the Asherah poles and all that foolishness. Your descendants, Solomon, aren't going to be like your father David or like you are right now. In fact, Solomon, hate to break this to you, but there just, just might be a period of your life where even you, wisest man ever, kind of go off the rails a bit. Now beyond that, Solomon, you're a wise man. What do you suppose the people are going to do when the king and the priests are out serving other gods? But God continues. He says, Solomon, I believe in allowing people to make their own choices. And I know that not even you and all your wisdom will always make the best choices. So, so Solomon, keep this in mind. No matter what happens, no matter what bad choices you make, and no matter what situations arise as a consequence of those choices, if you will, humble yourself, seek my face, and repent from those bad choices that you've made. Here's the, here's the promise. I will forgive, and I will heal. And we haven't gone through half the Bible like I like to do some weeks. Because this is that concise and clear. Now, I've kind of mentioned this before, but if you've been through a Daniel and Revelation seminar, you've seen how God accurately predicted the history of the world empires from Babylon all the way down to the present day, right? And hopefully, that has bolstered your faith that God ultimately is in control. And that's fantastic, and I'm glad that we do that. But I'm here today to remind you that it's much more personal, much more immediate than Babylon, Medo Persia, da, 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 right? The same God that showed Daniel that Babylon would be followed by Medo Persia, that, which would be followed by Alexander the Great, who would be followed by his four generals, all the way on down the line, has a message for each one of us as individuals. And that message is as sure as the visions that Daniel had. And here it is. If my people who are called by my name, that's you and me, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, if you think that God just kind of said this off the cuff or that it doesn't apply to us today because this is him talking to Solomon in the temple and it's thousands of years ago. I beg you to reconsider. He made this promise to Solomon, not about just Solomon, not about just physical Israel of that day. He said, my people who are called by my name. That's all of us. And we don't have to look to Babylon and Medo Persia and all these things to see God keep his promises. We can look back to May of 1940. Some of you were alive in 1940, if I'm not greatly mistaken. You were young, but you were alive. And in May of 1940, this promise is kept. 
And as a result, the world is how it is, not as it could be. Not that the world's great, but it could be worse. So let's start wrapping things up here because it's, it's, it's time. Now, something I've been thinking about as I've been preparing this involves Sabbath school. Now, some of you may or may not be aware that, at least in theory, Sabbath school begins at 9.30 with 15 minutes of prayer time. And the idea is that you come in to church and it's, you know, 9.28, 9.29, and 59 seconds, whatever it is, and you come in and you sit down and you pray. Maybe you grab a friend and pray together. It's little groups. Maybe you pray as an individual. But the idea is that from 9.30 to 9.45-ish, we're in here praying. And that at 9.45-ish, we then transition to the regular Sabbath school program. Now, this is where I do this. My name is Dave, and I'm always late. Okay? Always late. If I'm late to my own funeral, don't be surprised. Hope to miss it entirely, actually, quite honestly. But I, I don't want you to be upset or mad or think that I'm accusing anyone of anything when I, when I say this. But the fact of the matter is that when we made this change, it got interpreted as, oh, Sabbath school starts at 9.45 now, so as long as we're there by 10-ish, we'll be fine. And I'd like to say that I'm kidding about that, but I was at a board meeting two days ago, and somebody said, when does Sabbath school start? Somebody said 9.45. And the answer is no, Sabbath school starts at 9.30 with 15 minutes of prayer. So, one other thing. I'm pretty bummed that we've had to postpone this walking with Jesus thing that we're doing with uh, Elder Bentley. But I also believe that it's providential because, I'm going to be straight with you, I don't think we're ready. I don't think we're ready. I don't think we're committed to the work that's going to be required to, to pull this event off. I don't think that we're spiritually ready for an influx of people. And I think that, I mean, I feel bad for the guy having to get his rotator cuff fixed having just done that a year ago, myself, um, I think that we've been given a bit of a reprieve. And I'm going to call this reprieve an analogy to the mysterious three days that Hitler said, stop. We have time now. We have time to make sure that we're in the word, that our walk with Jesus is going well and to develop the habits of discipleship that we need if we're going to lead others to Jesus and that we're, if we're going to endure to the end and be saved. So, where am I at? Here's an idea. Next Sabbath, week from today, well, call it six days and, you know, 21 hours. Maybe instead of trying to get here by whatever o'clock, we commit to ourselves, to each other, and to Almighty God that we'll be here, ready to pray, at 9.30. And at 9.30, let's come in here, either by yourself or with a friend, and pray. And let's commit to each other, right now, to turn away from whatever is distracting us or impeding us on Sabbath morning, Maybe plan a little bit better. I was going to be on time today, but I forgot that I got this monster puppy now who cannot let me out the door without playing fetch for a few minutes. I would have been on time, or at least closer. So I got to plan better. I got to know that that dog needs 15 minutes of running back and forth before I can walk out the door. So let's think about this. Let's pray about it. And let's come together next Sabbath morning at 930 and seek God's face. Seek his forgiveness for where we failed him. Seek God's will in our lives as individuals and as a church. And what history shows us, contemporary history, history that you can look at photos of, that you can watch videos of, that you can talk to people who remember, shows us that miracles will happen.